liberal churches will say heaven is just a metaphor, and then act all surprised when no one comes to church. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where we build churches in Minecraft while talking about Christianity. I'm working on my brand new Presbyterian church right over here, and I'm going to talk about my experience in a broadly liberal mainline Protestant denomination. So I said I was going to talk about what liberal and conservative churches get half right. Really, um, I was using liberal and conservative churches as sort of a stand-in for mainline and evangelical Protestant churches. That's really what I'm going to be talking about. Now, not all mainline Protestant churches are liberal. My whole Reconquista movement means finding the mainline Protestant churches that are still conservative and trying to revive those. But generally, the split between mainline and evangelical Christianity has been down the lines of liberal and conservative. So mainline Protestant churches are, you know, the original Protestant churches with roots in the Reformation, like my denomination, the PCUSA, or the Episcopal Church, or the Church of England, or the state Lutheran churches in Europe. And evangelical Protestant churches are churches that have split off from those mainline churches, usually on the grounds of those mainline churches becoming too liberal and abandoning the essentials of the faith. Now... I am generally very theologically conservative, you know, not as theologically conservative as some people, because, you know, I believe in evolution and stuff, but I'm more on the theologically conservative end. I'm on the very theologically conservative end of my denomination, the PCUSA, but that's because my denomination has so many liberals in it. Um, so basically, generally, I'm a lot more sympathetic to the evangelical Protestant side on most issues, but I think that when they split off from the mainline churches, there were some important ideas that they unfortunately left behind. Like, they were clinging to the essential doctrines of the faith, like the, you know, deity of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ, and most importantly, the gospel, which is that Jesus died for our sins so that we might be saved. So that's what they were really clinging to when they split off, because they felt like the mainline churches had abandoned those things. But because they were clinging so tightly to that, they sort of lost focus on a lot of other important aspects of Christianity. So because of that, I say that mainline churches and evangelical churches these days tend to both preach half of the gospel. And if you ask a mainline uh, your average mainline church versus your average evangelical church what the gospel is, they will both give you different answers that I think only are half correct. So the evangelical church, their answer, if you ask what is the gospel, they're going to say, oh, Jesus died for your sins so that you can go to heaven if you believe in him. Something along those lines. Um, the aim of the gospel for the evangelical churches will be basically just you going to heaven after you die. It'll be like your soul... Uh, will go to heaven after you die, and you will be forgiven of your sins. That's basically what the evangelicals will say is the gospel. And nothing there is technically wrong. I would say it's a bit incomplete. If you ask a mainline Protestant church what the gospel is, they'll say something like, uh, Jesus started a kingdom of love and reconciliation, so let's build a better world right here and now. So unlike the evangelicals, the mainline churches will have a very earth-focused rather than a heaven-focused view of what the gospel is. They'll say it's like Jesus came to make the world a better place. Uh, so their focus, uh, their gospel work, is mainly social justice. Now, I don't think social justice is always bad, but I think social justice without being rooted in the scriptures will end up just being Marxism. And because the mainline churches often do abandon the authority of the scriptures, the way they do social justice is basically just, you know, whatever the current, you know, left-wing narrative says to do. So that's why I think, even though they're, they are generally technically correct that the church's job is to do justice in the world, the church's job is to improve the world, um, because they're not rooted in the Holy Scriptures, they don't do it from the right point of view, and they end up often supporting evil, even, because the mainline churches often support abortion and the LGBT agenda. So, the reason that they are both half correct is because, you know, the gospel, for most of church history, was a lot more inclusive. The gospel was about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God breaking into this world, and the kingdom of God includes personal salvation. The kingdom of God includes individuals going to heaven, but it wasn't limited to that. It wasn't just about that. And 
heaven wasn't seen as some distant place far off from this world. If you read the, you know, Protestant confessions of faith, it says that there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. So the final hope for the Christian isn't escaping this world and going to heaven. It's heaven coming down to earth. So the mainline Christians are right in saying that the kingdom of heaven really begins on earth. The kingdom of heaven is not something separate from this world that we have to escape to. A lot of evangelicals have been wrong in speaking of heaven as something we need to escape to. It's something separate from this world. However, um, the evangelicals are right in seeing heaven as something that's actually real, as seeing eternal life and the resurrection as something that's actually real, which a lot of mainline Protestants do not. A lot of mainline Protestants will speak of heaven and in radical cases speak of God as something that's mainly just a metaphor. Now, the majority of mainline Protestant pastors still would not say heaven is a metaphor. They would still at least say they think that there is some sort of life after death, but it's kind of rare to see them boldly proclaim, yes, there is life after death. Yes, we are more than just clumps of atoms. Because there is just this broad agnosticism to the supernatural that exists in mainline churches, and that's really hurting their message. Um, so what I think, what I think the, um, the gospel really is, what the gospel needs to be, is that the gospel fundamentally is about the kingdom of God. The gospel is not uh, a message that says, here's a way for you to go to heaven. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel includes that, but the gospel is fundamentally about the kingdom of God. I think N.T. Wright, who's a, a modern, you know, Anglican mainline theologian, he's done a lot of great work recognizing this, that yeah, the gospel is not a formula for how you personally can go to heaven. The gospel is about the kingdom of God, and the king is Jesus. The gospel is that God has become king in Jesus. But what does that kingdom of God include? That kingdom of God includes restoration of all things, including restoration of this world, and that means that in the final restoration, the final resurrection of all things, you will have eternal life. And of course, we also do believe that when a believer dies, their soul does go to heaven, but that's not the final destination. That's just like a waiting room for the final resurrection when they'll be given, you know, new imperishable physical bodies. So that's what I think the gospel is. That's what the Bible says the gospel is, because the Bible speaks of the gospel in connection to the kingdom of God. Just look through your Bible, look through your the four gospels and see where the Bible says the word gospel. It's usually not connected to something about justification. The word gospel in the Bible is usually connected either to the kingdom of God or to the story of Jesus himself. I think um, N.T. Wright is kind of correct that even though the Protestant Reformation was correct on its doctrine of justification, the Protestant Reformation, I think, was a bit wrong in having too much of an abstract definition of what the gospel is so that the gospel becomes just this abstract formula about how justification works rather than the gospel being centered on specifically Jesus and his kingship and his kingdom and all that. So I think mainline churches are right in recovering the fact that the gospel is really about Jesus and his kingdom, uh, but they're wrong in making that just a metaphorical thing. They're wrong in denying the supernatural element of it. So I think both sides listening to each other will help both of them because the mainline churches they want to do social justice they want to spread what they think is the kingdom of god here on earth by doing justice but the reason they've la they've been so impotent the reason they've lacked all the energy necessary to do so is because they've removed all the supernatural elements from it now, of course, I'm speaking in generalizations here. The, I'd still say the majority of mainline churches don't deny the supernatural, but the majority of the mainline churches don't boldly proclaim the supernatural either. It's, I would say, maybe a, a, a very small percentage of mainline churches, very small, you know, actively, um, blatantly deny the supernatural, the existence of the supernatural. Most of them don't. Then I would say um, a, a larger portion will boldly affirm the supernatural because there still is a strong segment of mainline churches that are still theologically conservative. I would say those are the best kinds of churches out of, uh, out of everything. But I would say the biggest chunk of mainline churches, there's just sort of like a vague agnosticism to the supernatural. Maybe they believe in it, sort of, but they don't talk about it enough. But the point is, even if they do technically believe it, 
if they're talking about the kingdom of God, if they're talking about social justice, but it's not being done in anticipation of when Jesus is going to physically come back and make all things right, that sort of destroys all motivation to do social justice. It's like, the church has always agreed we should do justice. The church has always agreed that we should be making the world better. But why? What is our motivation for doing so? Traditionally, the motivation has been Jesus is going to return to make all things new, so we should be doing justice in this world in anticipation of that. But if the mainline church has sort of removed the supernatural elements from the faith, then it's more like we're doing social justice just for the sake of humanity. And, you know, it's a lot harder for people to have faith in humanity because of how flawed and sinful humanity is. So that's why if you remove God from the equation, everything else falls apart. The essence of liberal Christianity, the essence of liberal Protestantism, which began like the 1700s, was basically trying to have Christianity without God. It was basically trying to treat God as something optional in Christianity. They were like, okay, because of modern philosophy or whatever, maybe we don't believe in God anymore, but what if we could still have the moral teachings of Christianity without having God himself? That's sort of why, like, you know, there's the Jefferson Bible, which Thomas Jefferson wrote, which basically tries to take all the supernatural elements out of the Bible and only focus on, like, the moral teachings of Jesus. And the reason that has always failed is because you literally cannot separate any of Jesus's quote-unquote moral teachings from the proclamation that he is God, that he did die for our sins. But, like, here's an example. Jesus said you need to forgive other people. You need to love your enemies. You need to forgive their sins. Why? He didn't simply say, you need to forgive people's sins because that's a good thing to do and it benefits humanity if you do that. No, he said, you need to be forgive other people's sins because God has forgiven your sins. You can't separate any of Jesus' moral teachings from the supernatural claims. That's why when some secular atheist or agnostic or someone of a different religion says, oh, I'm not a Christian, but I still respect, I, I like the teachings of Jesus, I'm like, I don't think you've really read the teachings of Jesus because I don't think you can separate a single one of Jesus' teachings from the proclamation that he is God, that he has come to judge the world. You can't separate it. And a lot of people, a lot of people think they can. A lot of people who say like, a lot of, I don't know, liberal Christians or just, you know, secular liberals who will say, oh, these conservative Christians aren't acting Christ-like or whatever. I don't think those people almost never have actually read the Gospels and read what Christ said in the Gospels. And of course, I know some liberal scholarship will be like, oh, the Gospels might not be accurate accounts of what Jesus said. Okay, but if if the Gospels aren't accurate accounts of what Jesus said, then we, then there are no accurate accounts and then we have to just guess. And then that means um, trying to quote Jesus on anything is completely meaningless. Anyway, so the mainline Protestant churches have greatly suffered from that. The, all churches across the West are experiencing a membership decline of some kind, but the mainline churches are experiencing the worst. And they are always just like running around in circles, scratching their heads, wondering, why do we keep losing members? And it's, the answer is so obvious, but they refuse to see it. They're like so blind to it. They try and say, oh, maybe we're just not structuring church the right way. Maybe we need to, like, update our social media. Maybe we need... No. You guys are losing members because you don't believe in God anymore. There's no reason to go to church if church is just some metaphor for uh, uh, social justice that people can find on Facebook anyway. Um, even though I'm a big critic of John MacArthur, he does have a quote that's very good. It says, if the church becomes just like the world, it has nothing to... If the church becomes just like the world, it has nothing to offer the world. So that very much applies to the mainline churches. They've basically become just like the world in their secularism, largely speaking. And I'm trying to fix the mainline churches. I still am a mainline Protestant, but I think they're greatly suffering from that. And of course, the, the biggest reason why they shouldn't do that is because if you're an atheist and you claim to be a Christian, you'll probably go to hell. <laughs> like, I, I've been talking about the, the practical reasons for why mainline churches should stop being so secular, but there's also the spiritual reason of, you know, if you want to have eternal life, you need to believe this stuff is real. You need to actually believe in Jesus, because Jesus said that, you know, if you, if you deny him before others, Jesus said he will deny you before his father. And it's another problem I've seen in a lot of mainline churches, like, um, my father's on the session of our Presbyterian church, our PCUSA church, 
and basically the only thing the session ever talks about is practical matters, like, oh, something broke again in our 150-year-old falling apart building. I still like having old buildings, but, um, or they'll say, oh, um, some music people are mad about their salaries, we need to make a, a committee to address that. And they, they talk about all these practical matters, but there's almost never conversation any conversation about theological or spiritual matters on the session. There's almost never any conversation of how can we get people saved. There's no, never any conversation of how can we make sure that we are spreading the, the gospel of Christ to our community. And I think it's because even if it's not explicit, because my mainline church is more moderate, even if it's not explicit, there's this implicit denial of anything supernatural. There's this implicit denial that any of this religious stuff is actually real. Um, so, if the mainline church wants to succeed in its mission of, you know, doing justice, of improving the world, of having a positive influence on the world, it needs to see the supernatural elements of the faith as not only real, but non-negotiable. Because sometimes I'll talk to mainline pastors who'll be like, oh, I believe Jesus really rose from, from the dead, but some of my colleagues don't, some of the other pastors in my denomination don't, and I'm okay with that. I'm like, dude, why are you okay with that? That's actually like a super big problem. You should totally not be okay with that. <laughs> so... Yeah, the mainline church is not going to have any sort of influence at all. It kind of already has lost almost all of its influence, but what little influence it does have is going to completely disappear. It's going to die out in the next generation if it does not turn back from this blatant apostasy and this denial of the supernatural. On the other hand, evangelical churches, I would say, you know, in terms of getting people into heaven, they're doing a much better job because they actually believe this heaven stuff is real. They actually believe Jesus is real. But they deny a lot of important stuff about the kingdom of God. They have almost a quasi-gnostic view of what heaven and what the gospel is. Um, if, the, if the mainline churches deny the heavenly realities of the gospel, the evangelical churches often deny the earthly realities of the gospel. The church's mission is to help the poor, and the mainline churches do a far better job at that than evangelical churches. I'm not saying evangelical churches don't do food pantries or uh, things like that, but mainline churches do it a lot more. And in evangelical churches, there's this implicit, you know, unspoken assumption that the best way to help the poor really is just by saving their souls, by preaching the gospel to them. And that's more important than giving them a meal. Jesus and the apostles never separated tending to people's physical needs from tending to their spiritual needs. The evangelical churches also... Um, this has been due to the influence of premillennialism and dispensationalism on the evangelical world, and it's influenced even evangelical churches which no longer hold to those theologies. But there's this idea that the world is a sinking ship, so it's pointless to even try and help it. We just need to save people off of this sinking ship of a world, and that has been horrible for the church's witness in the world. Christians used to be stereotyped as the people who are always building those hospitals and doing those charities and building those great universities. Like, all the, almost all the Ivy League universities were started by devout Christians, you know. Uh, Princeton was started by Presbyterians. Yale was started by, you know, conservative Calvinist Puritans. Uh, Brown was started by Baptists. You know, a lot of these universities were started by very devout Bible-believing Protestants. Um, but, of course, they were started by the churches that are now the mainline Protestant churches, and because the mainline churches have been hijacked by liberalism, so have the universities they started. I always say liberals never create anything good. They only hijack what Christians create. Um, but evangelicals ever since then, ever since the evangelicals split off, they've never really created any great institutions. Like, they've made a few Bible colleges here and there, but those Bible colleges have had, like, zero impact outside of Christian bubbles. They've been nothing like the great Ivy League universities. And evangelicals also don't create as many hospitals or, or great, um, I, they do some good charities, but, you know, generally when you see a Christian hospital, it's like, it's founded either by, like, a Catholic church or a mainline Protestant church. It's generally not started by, you know, New Life Grace Evangelical Church Hospital. You don't see as much of that. Now Christians have been stereotyped as people who are just conspiracy theorists and want to hide from the world and uh, just basically hate everything. And that's sort of been due to the influence of dispensationalism on evangelical churches, which says this world is a sinking ship. Now, no one can deny that this world is full of sin, but the church's job is to redeem the world because redeem the world from its sin, not to abandon the world. 
and the evangelical churches largely do abandon the world. And I think that goes against the teaching of the kingdom of God. So like I said, uh, mainline churches abandon the heavenly realities of the gospel. Evangelical churches abandon the earthly realities of the gospel. Uh, you know, helping the poor is just as much important for the for our gospel witness as, you know, preaching spiritual salvation. So you really can't do one without the other. I don't think, I really don't think one can survive without the other. Now, I would say the Catholic Church is because the Catholic Church has not been split down this liberal and conservative lines, at least not yet. There's no, there's been no mainline and evangelical split in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church legitimately does do a very good job at, you know, tending to both the physical and spiritual needs of the world. I think that's why the Catholic Church has way more of an influence on contemporary culture than any sort of Protestant churches do. So I think the Catholic Church is doing a very good job. Now you might say, okay, if the Catholic Church is doing the best job, why should I not just become Catholic? Well, the Catholic Church is doing the best job today. But back before the Protestant churches split, before all the mainline evangelical splits, I think the Protestant churches were doing an even better job than the Catholic churches were today. Like, there's a reason Ivy League universities were started by Protestants, not Catholics. I think Protestantism just is the strongest, purest form of Christianity. Even though it's not the only valid form, it's the strongest one. But I think that the stronger something is, the more likely Satan is going to attack it. Like, a lot of Catholics or Orthodox will say the fact that Protestantism has been hijacked by liberals proves that it ha has a shaky foundation. Well, not necessarily, because, you know, Mormonism has never been hijacked by liberals. The Jehovah's Witnesses have never been hijacked by liberals, but all of us can agree those are very heretical groups. I think that the more of a threat something is to Satan's kingdom, the more Satan is going to want to hijack it. So... It's like, the, I think the reason Protestantism has been hijacked more than any other religious group at all is because Protestantism is, and has historically been, the greatest threat to Satan's kingdom. Protestantism has had more, you know, missionaries and distributed the Bible to more people than anyone ever, really. Protestantism has built the strongest societies in human history. So I'm not going to give up on Protestantism. Not, I'm not going to give up on mainline Protestantism. But if Protestantism is to survive... It needs to reverse this split. It needs to reverse this splitting of the gospel between mainline and evangelical. The evangelicals need to come back into the fold of the mainline churches and help correct the mainline church's utter lack of faith in the supernatural. So that's just my own personal rant, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Even if you didn't, I hope it made you think. And I'm going to see you guys later.